Brendan, there was a very dramatic budget uh, by the Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng on, on Friday. And there's been a very dramatic reaction in the market since. Uh, what is the Brexit component of this whole situation? Well, I think this um, budget is a, a quintessentially Brexit budget. And I, I say that really for, for three reasons. One, it's entirely based on wishing and hoping and thinking and praying. It's not based on physic, on, on uh, statistics. It's not based on any serious economic analysis. The markets don't like it. But underlying it all is the view, the triumph of the world, that if you believe in it uh, hard enough, uh, then it will be possible to have uh, enormous economic growth and these um, enormous sums which are going to be borrowed on international markets will simply be a, a, a passing irritation. Uh, Brexit is based on fantasy and wishful thinking, and, and this budget is a very good example of that. The, the suggested second... that this is at last uh, revealing the true agenda of the um, conservative Brexiteers, particularly the, the, the well-funded ones, um, who I think that's true. A, a Singapore I, I, on Thames sort of view of what Brexit should be, in sharp contrast to what a large number of people who voted for Brexit uh, presumably were thinking of. Yes, that's another of the reasons why it's a, a, a fundamentally Brexit bu budget. Uh, it's that um, when people like Dominic Cummings in 2016 said, uh, we mustn't have an alternative view of. United Kingdom outside outside the European Union, because everyone then will be able to vote for the Brexit they want. Um, he was quite right from his point of view. Uh, there was always an important minority within the Brexit coalition who wanted precisely what you're talking about. Um, Singapore on Thames, a minimal state, the, the least possible elements of um, redistribution from the activities of the state. Uh, over the past five or six years, that um, tendency has becoming been has become stronger within the Conservative Party, uh, and now it's pretty well dominant within the present administration. Um, we've seen this proposal to get rid of all existing European legislation by the end of 2023, much of which would be the the entrenchment of of rights. There's um, a, an interesting contrast between Truss and Johnson. Uh, Johnson, I think, um, bought into this Singapore on Thames agenda, but didn't have the intellectual or political stamina to see it through. I think that Truss, not necessarily in her own person, but through the people that she's got working for her and, if you like, dominating her, um, it will be a much more coherent, um, much more dangerous uh, approach to Singapore on Thames uh, than was the case uh, uh, under Johnson. But nevertheless, nevertheless, there will be political pushback. Um, Johnson had this Red Wall coalition on the basis of which he won in 2019. Uh, and that, as you rightly say, is going to be entirely destroyed um, by, the, by this budget and by the, the policies that it implies. Uh, Liz Truss was uh, extraordinarily frank in talking um, dismissively about the importance of redistribution uh, in a recent interview. And um, the energy crisis, the cost of living crisis is going to make this question of redistribution uh, a very pertinent one indeed. And I'm not sure that she has answers to it, which will continue, which will maintain the, um, the Red Wall coalition. But if this fails, I mean, if this goes down under the scythe of the markets, if they have to do a U-turn, if they have to... Um... Uh, I mean, it's very difficult to see how precisely they're going to be able to get out of the bind in which they're in between higher interest rates and a falling currency and the inflation impact that that, of course, has. But if this does fail overall, what does that mean for the survival of Brexit as a proposition in UK politics? There are lots of reasons why Brexit isn't going to last um, as long as its um, proponents hope. Uh, and certainly, in my view, the likely failure of this um, latest attempt to make Brexit work uh, will be a, a factor working towards the reverse of the Brexit. Uh, 
Um, but I think one shouldn't underestimate um, the hesitations that there are, even on the Remainer, on the rejoiner side, about pressing too hard and too quickly towards rejoining, because they're afraid that the demons which have been loosed in 2016 uh, will come to the surface again if there were another referendum. Uh, in, in, to some extent, uh, the situation is so awful that um, there's, uh, there are problems associated with going back or with going forward. And I, I fear stasis in British politics over the next few years um, until the situation probably becomes objectively so intolerable um, that we will move towards um, a, a rejoined position. Well, one key factor in that could be the obvious failure of the uh, even the Singapore on Thames version of Brexit agenda in trade matters, that there was a great promise and a lot of um, uh, a lot made of the chances of a trade deal with the United States. And one of the visions of Singapore on Thames was to get much closer to America, be much more like the United States uh, as an economy, as a society. Um, but that appears to have um, hit a, a brick wall because in, in New York, Liz Truss had to confess that there was really no prospect, something which has been known for a long time, I would have thought, um, that there's really no prospect of a, of a trade deal with the United States anytime soon. And that's for reasons which actually go beyond the immediate political problem, which is, of course, Northern Ireland, the, the protocol. But, but the protocol the reason... also raises the issue of, of, of the integrity of the United Kingdom. <laughs> Uh, because of its implications also for Scotland. And it I think the reason that... why she, she disavowed any immediate possibility of a free trade agreement uh, was to cement her position within the Conservative Party on the Northern Ireland Protocol, because there's been an argument up till now, oh, you can't offend the Americans over the Northern Ireland Protocol because they won't give us a free trade agreement. Mm. Well, once that's off the table, in, in a way, it becomes easier for her um, to pursue um, a, uh, an approach to the Northern Ireland Protocol, which in my view is equally reckless with that of the budget. Um, but there won't be this countermeasure, this, this rod in pickle, as they used to say in the Foreign Office, um, of denying the United Kingdom a free trade agreement. It, this is a very interesting example in the way in which the, 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 the Brexit process eats itself up. What, what had been presented as originally a great advantage, namely the possibility of a free trade agreement with America, is now seen as being a burden that we're, we're rid of so that um, the United Kingdom can pursue um, a different policy on Northern Ireland. Uh, I doubt very much whether Article 16 will, will be triggered. Um, I think the government have decided they want to go more, more carefully they don't want to provoke an immediate trade dispute with the United, with the European Union. Um, but I think the direction of travel, of undermining the protocol, is, is very much still being maintained. How much is the position on the Northern Ireland Protocol linked to fears of Scottish independence? I, I'm not sure that the, that the two are, 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 are really the same thing. Uh, I think that um, uh, from the point of view of um, the unionists, the Conservative and Unionist Party, um, it, it would accommodate uh, Irish unification. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily welcome it, it would oppose it, um, but I think it would be much, much easier for the Conservative and Unionist Party um, to live with a united Ireland than it would be to, to live with a, uh, a Scotland which became independent. So I, I don't think that the two are, are, are entirely parallel. For some of the sovereignties, uh, of, of course, there is a parallel, um, that the, the borders of the United Kingdom uh, must remain intact, they must remain integral, uh, and it would be a particularly ironic outcome if a, a vote, a pro-Vex Brexit vote, which supposedly was going to be a vote to re retain and restore British sovereignty, uh, ended up with less British sovereignty because Northern Ireland and Scotland left the United Kingdom. It does seem to me that Scotland is a very important part of, uh, of this story. The uh, crisis that we have at the moment, the potential guilt strike, does remind us that uh, ahead of the 2014 referendum in the last two weeks, when there was some panic about uh, the possibility of the Scots voting for independence, uh, there was a 
unilateral English guarantee given to the gilt market. Uh, now, we are borrowing more than twice as much uh, than we were back in 2014. Um, and added to that is the potential crisis in sterling, because one of the barriers uh, to support for Scottish independence um, in Scotland has certainly been fears about uh, leaving the pound sterling and, and having to set up a Scottish pound, uh, which is now SNP policy effectively, and then obviously joining the euro. So any loss, fundamental loss of credibility by sterling, particularly against the euro, um, I think would strengthen the arguments for in independence. And, th and there's a final point here, which is that if the reaction, which we're beginning to see perhaps in some circles, in the Labour and the Liberal Democrats, to this crisis is to become a little bit more bold on advocating some closer, uh, some return to a closer relationship with the EU. The more that happens, the easier, in fact, it will make Scottish independence to be. I mean, do you think any of these factors um, are becoming powerful, in particular, the reaction of the Labour and Liberal Democrat parties to this crisis? Could that be positive? Well, I, I, I think they're still a little way away from um, leaping over their own shadows. Um, I think as far as Scotland's concerned, there will be uh, an increase for support for independence, the more the difficulties of sterling become clear. But that's just part of, uh, of a process which has been going on since 2016. Uh, a reason for um, uh, eschewing um, Scottish independence in 2014 was for many people the fear that they would be excluded from the, from the European Union if uh, Scotland became independent. Uh, of course, when Brexit came along, for which the Scots didn't vote, uh, that argument was stood on its head. And we, um, we have seen over the past um, eight years, six years, um, growing support for Scottish independence. And I think the the prevails of Scotland, of, of Stirling, uh, are, are simply part of that process. Uh, I think it will take a little while yet before the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party become um, uh, courageous enough to be able to say the problem with Brexit is not so much a hard Brexit or a soft Brexit, it's Brexit itself. One very interesting thing to look out for, I think, in the conference this week in, 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 in Liverpool, Labour conference, will be the question of proportional representation. Because I, I've always thought that uh, if we're to get back into the European Union, then um, a PR or, or different kind of electoral system is both a precondition uh, and a way of ensuring that we remain within the European Union. In, in a previous discussion, you highlighted how relatively weak uh, Liz Truss's position is inside the Conservative Party and the nature of her victory in the leadership contest. I mean, is it imaginable that a crisis such as we could be entering, uh, which is com a combination of a very serious economic financial crisis and a constitutional one, um, an existential one in some respects for the Brexit project, could actually bring her down? And that um, the, the ongoing psychodrama that has been the Conservative leadership over the last few years um, is likely to take a new and perhaps even more um, dangerous twist. Well, it, it, it's certainly possible that it will take a new twist. Whether it will be a more dangerous one or a less dangerous one is very, very difficult to predict. One of the other reasons why I think um, the budget is a, a quintessentially Brexit budget um, is that it makes clear the, the revolutionary and the iconoclastic nature uh, of Brexit because Liz Truss has specifically disavowed the policies and the attitudes of the government in which government, the Conservative government in which she's been a, a minister over the past 10 years. Um, Brexit is a, a revolutionary creed, if you like, and revolutionary creeds always can lead to, to volatility and uncertain and unpredictable outcomes. It wouldn't surprise me at all if um, fairly rapidly Liz Truss were replaced by who knows, uh, who knows as an individual, and who knows what their political philosophy might be. Could it be constitutionally possible to replace a prime minister again without a general election? Um, the, the British constitution is silent on the subject because the British constitution is silent on most subjects. 
It's Dave Dick Cross, Richard Crossman said that the British Constitution says what, exactly what the person with the loudest voice and the nicest suit says, um, and there's a, there's truth in that. I, I would be surprised if uh, King Charles, relatively new to the job, uh, were willing to say, "No, no, this isn't good enough. We've got to have a, a new election." That would be a, a, an exercise of constitutional powers, uh, which his, his mother um, didn't uh, allow herself. I, I think he'd be a very bold man indeed if he were prepared to insist on that. The Conservative Party, obviously, if it decides to get rid of Liz Truss, won't want to have a, um, an immediate general election. Well, these are clearly very, um, potentially very dark and dangerous waters constitutionally and um in every other sense. Uh, many thanks, Brendan. We will continue this conversation, no doubt, in the coming days and weeks. Um, let's hope we have good news, better news to consider. But you're right, um, the picture is very murky. I hope you enjoyed this latest video. It's one of a series of videos about Europe, about Brexit, and about the future of the European Union uh, from the Federal Trust. Uh, I hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel and then you'll have notifications of future videos, which I hope you'll enjoy uh, as much as perhaps you enjoyed this one.